It is week 10. It is the week in which we talk about community and collaboration. And this is the theoretical frameworks upon which we're going to build this week's content. And there's two things to give you a quick heads up about. The first is that the theory in this episode gets a very solid workout in the live learning and the Shadow Hawker session. So it will come in handy immediately. Now, as always, what we're interested in understanding is how can you make use of the idea of community and the idea of collaboration inside the projects that you're currently using. And there's a lot of emphasis in terms of the community, the development of an audience, an audience that has a sense of identity around who they are based on how they interact with your product. And also it's worth considering the idea of community between creators and collaborators. So you can look at community from a top-down view. These are my audience and the consumer to consumer engagement across my audience. And you can look at community from the perspective of around. These are the peers, these are the networks upon which I can build up my own connection to others. So, as always, the key to the theory is not just to be going and reciting it, but to be saying, well, what can I do with it in terms of this project I'm working on? And then, what can I do with this in terms of my future projects? Also, we are going to talk about the language of marketing. If you had a community-based goal inside your initial plan, if you set out, say, what I want to do is attract n number of followers. I want to have 100 followers. Now, on YouTube, 100 followers unlocks a the next level of access to YouTube resources. That includes monetization. If you think of it this way, then you start to think in terms of, well, my goals, what are my objectives? And then you start thinking in terms of, well, if I need 100 new followers, that is existing product to new audience. That is a, an Ansoft matrix square. Compare that to, I need 1,000 hours of watch time. I can get that 1,000 hours by having greater amounts of consumption of my videos from my existing versus I need 100 users. Well, that's a new market. I need to bring in another user. I need to bring in another watcher. I need to bring in another subscriber. We want to be thinking in terms both of the language of community and the language of marketing and the marketing thinking. So there's a lot of growth strategy embedded around community in the outset that you want to build up a body of people who are following you and from within that, you can then start thinking, this is my preset, prepackaged target market. These are my followers. I create the value offer for them. They co-create the value offer with me. We are the starting point for the next round of conceptual frameworks. So you can start from an Ansoft matrix. You can start from a GE matrix once you have an audience. On your way to getting that audience, you may be looking at diversification and you may be looking at the challenges of, I need to offer products to audiences whilst I need to recruit audiences to my products. So this is community. It's not actually that TV show, but it is the question of, how do we use consumer to consumer connection in order to build a business to consumer framework? So there's a couple of things. Uh, in terms of community-focused sites, what we look for and what I want you to think about is a community does not need a site in order to be a community. You can form a community of peers and you can form a group of self-identifying members of a community around any point where you can have a dynamic interaction from consumer to consumer. Now this can be a dedicated forum like we've got on Wattle, this can be a dedicated event like we have with the Zoom, or it can be a gaming server. Uh, it's actually one of the weaknesses of modern gaming, and I'm going to say modern gaming as in the late, 20, late 2019 to early 2020s, 
view of game servers as dynamic places that don't have persistent lobbies, that don't have the ability for a player to choose where they want to go and choose which server they want to be on, because that is reducing the overall sense of community. I have my feeling is that part of the reason is the game companies have looked at what created community in the 210s. When you think about something as far back as the origins of Team Fortress 2, where persistent servers allow for the development of a very robust, but also very vocal community. We could connect with each other and all agree that we'd meet up on server 19, Australasia, Oceania, server 19, 7.30 on a Tuesday night, the 30 of us would show up to play Team Fortress. We would then start to build an identity and we could build a routine connection to each other because we had the capacity to meet, identify each other and identify responses to each other. That meant that we were spending more time focusing on each other and less time focusing on the downloadable content and the new hats that was offering. Consequence is that you end up with uh, the capacity. Humans have this great capacity to pack bond with anything, including each other, and we create these rolling open communities. Your followership on Twitter and the people who you follow, those who follow you and those who you follow, the mutuals, people who have a mutual follower followership relationship on any social media platform tend to be the basis of your own personal community. You have a whole bunch of people who you follow who you don't think of as members of your community. And you have a bunch of people who you follow who you think of as members because you have a different dynamic between them. And that consumer to consumer dynamic is one of the things that you need to enable if you want to have a successful marketing oriented community. It also means that there is a set of things that you've got to do as a marketer, which includes handing off the control and ownership of your community to a certain extent, whilst also maintaining some basic uh, digital hygiene, like moderation, like effective dealing with harassment, like having acceptable use policies that are enforced and are enforced to the spirit of the law, not the technical letter of the law. Any community guideline that is enforced entirely on the black letter reading of the community guidelines will favor trolls and those who will skirt right up to the edge and will aggravate their enemies into breaking the technical letter, but not the spirit letter. They are bad people who you do not want in your community and you sure as hell don't want them as moderators. Because one of the things of the theoretical frameworks that are on board here a community has, there's a range of different theories around community, and the two that are important to me are the shared goods of value, of which I've done some work, and uh, there's a lot of stuff written about Howard Rheingold's interpretation of what forms a community, and he is the best researcher in this area, as he combined the lived experience of being at some of the foundational online cyber communities. Whole Earth Electronic Catalog, The Well, the great-grandparent of online community. He was part of its foundation. And also, he's a very smart researcher. The shared goods of value are important. The one to me to one, the Hoffman and Novak framework. Community cannot exist without conversation between community members. Everyone being a follower of a celebrity does not make them a community. Equally, parasocial connections, parasocial relationships are vertical and horizontal. If you feel that you have a connection to another person, whether that connection is unilateral or bilateral, it enhances your sense of community if you feel that you have a place where you are a member, so you have an in-group identification, and you have a sense of belonging, parasocial connection or actual social connection. Because it's really also one other really important thing to say here is, we will mention parasocial quite a lot, but parasocial is predicated on the idea that there's not an actual social connection. For example, in the Twitterverse, <coughs> on my connections, 
I have a parasocial connection to one of the wrestlers who I follow. Uh, I occasionally, I will tweet to them and I'll get a response from them um, now and then. They don't, they have not initiated to me. Whereas there's another uh, group of high-end uh, IT tech uh, cyber community people who will initiate contact to me and I will initiate contact to them because we have an actual social relationship. We know each other within the network and we know each other outside the network. So there is a combined opportunity here. If you've got a parasocial where it's a perhaps unilateral, you feel belonging, but also actual social where there is genuine connection between members of the community. These frameworks all exist and they all operate as a blend to create a community. So there's a couple of things that you want to think about here. One is in terms of community as product. You can go out to deliberately create community as a saleable item. Grocery clubs, the Lions Club, the Scouts, the Guides, the every sporting team on the planet who has a fan club. You can intentionally sell community, belonging, oneness, shared identity, shared out groups, shared in groups. You can sell it as a value proposition. It becomes an offering that has value and you co-create that value by uh, adopting the identity. Now the in-group out group thing is also something you wanna talk to uh, and you wanna be aware of. Uh, Dr. Egar has an amazing amount of research in this area. Their thesis was on fan identity and fan community. So I'm never gonna be as good as they are about this, but I do know a few tricks because I was their supervisor. The identity, the shared out group, and this is one of the danger points of all forms of community is you can form a community by a sense of outsider status of we're all bonded together by a common person target entity we're all outsiders together there's no internal conflict on that the self-identity of we're part of an out we're part of an in-group we have a shared identity of being outsiders doesn't set off any bodies wait, that doesn't make sense, alarms, because the sense of identity, of belonging and affiliation, bounded by, created by a sense of being us against the world, is the core value proposition. Which is also why you can use something like community theory to go dark side and create cults and cause all sorts of problems. So please don't, under the house rule of don't be evil, or be evil professionally and effectively, I really prefer that if you didn't go down the evil community pathway. Not least of which is it'll be very hard to explain in the future as to why I get to run the subject again if any of you mob go off and form your own cults. On the other hand, if you were to form a cult and you did need a charismatic icon, there's a number of lecturing staff over in Econometrics who would be fantastic leaders. Economics, that's the place you want to go for them, mate, not marketing. So, pricing. One of the things to understand about a community is that your financial price, you can use payment as gateway, payment as barrier to community. So something like a Facebook site can, a Facebook group is free notionally in exchange for the data. Your usage patterns, then you've got the freemium which is your usage inter patterns are interrupted by advertising. Uh, there's also where the brand, product, or company supports the community. So you have the official brand community. Uh, this is really weird, but pre-Web 2.0. Uh, so we're talking here 2001 to 2005. A lot of brands set up forums on their websites trying to build brand communities. And I can't think of anything weirder that I have been part of on the online than the time I was a member of a cat food community. Yes, Whiskers was running a community and I was like, I've got to see what happens inside a cat food community. And me and every other curious person went, oh right, curiosity and cats. Uh, yeah, got it. 
But that was how we did back then. The advertiser supported the community, built the community. I don't really remember much more than I was part of it. Compared to, say, the free community that existed out in the internet wilds of Usenet, uh, where news groups were a, a non-commercial, shared, open, global wattle forum. It looked like a wattle forum, it handled that as well as a wattle forum, and there was no real governance, there was no real ownership of it. Um, so there were certain... There was a certain Wild West sense to it, there was a certain mild uh, North to it, and a whole lot of digital compass metaphors, because it was genuinely free. You were hanging out in the community, and if you felt part of the community, you'd stay there. And this was a... This was the beginning of where you could have... You could see the origins of what Web 2.0 became. And Web 2.0 took this free platform and went, what if we made it advertiser interrupted? What if we found a way to monetize people gathering together to want to chat with each other? Because humans are inherently social. Then we added in some paid features. We added in some premium things. One of the strange ones was LiveJournal, which gave you the ability to buy from the LiveJournal server a digital icon uh, and give that to someone else, give that to someone else. So you could send for 199 US, you could send flowers on Valentine's Day to another user on the LiveJournal site. Now I think about it, the origins of downloadable content and NFTs have a much darker history than I recall. Also, as much as I can mock NFTs, I both bought and received digital flowers and digital chocolates on LiveJournal back in the day. So I can make fun of NFTs because I've been there and I've wasted my money on a bunch of pixels. So I can give it as much hell as I see fit. But also, outgroup. Outgroup status is maintained through exclusivity. Exclusivity that allows you to use a pricing function to create a premium, to create an exclusivity of access. So as much as I can make fun of the NFTs, and believe me, I can go for ages, they form a community. Now, sure, it's a community of marks and suckers, but when you see the little hexagon icon that says, I spent a stupid amount of money and the environment's future on an ape, a generated ape picture icon thing. Anyway, they, you bought a bored ape and you got your little hex icon, and now you are a member of an outgroup of a widely despised group of individuals with more money than sense, who get mocked routinely, who can now band together and really just, you know, feel that courage of where the future, because we bought an ape JPEG and other people are making fun of us. Community. <laughs> it works in predictable ways. So that's the other thing. Uh, look, I just want to say premium price in community is absolutely vital. It's amazing. It's how you get brands to be able to sell tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise and to have exclusivity, to have sneakers where there's only 100 copies of the sneakers in the world and in club out group. Are you in? Do you have the right shoes? Do you have the commercial notifier that says, I am part, I'm with the brand? It's brilliant. It's freaking brilliant. Uh, it's also why I'm really excited by bringing these ideas of luxury into some of the non-financial price considerations. So community is time expensive. Maintaining friendships and links and connections requires investment of energy. You have discovered that this semester as the Wattle site. If it has gone like it has in the last couple of years, there'll be a bunch of you going, there's, yes, it's really great that I've got all these social connections, but time, oh, uh, same for effort. You've got to understand the, if you're joining a new group, you've got to learn the social norms. You've got to work out who needs to be snubbed, who needs to be shunned, who needs to be followed, who needs to be adored. What's the, what are all the social parameters? There are, and that ties to learning curve as well. Uh, the faux pas is a concept that exists because you didn't know a social norm and therefore you your social price is expensive. Equally, something like uh, punk 
Yeah, I'm going to go a little old here. Uh, the 1970s, the creation of the punk movement was an out group, a commercially generated by Malcolm McLaren system of rebellion that was enabling Malcolm to sell more fashion off his high street fashion. He was selling expensive safety pins and very expensive pre-torn clothes to people who had more money and wanted to be outsiders. So they had wanted to buy their way into an outsider lifestyle and he was quite happy to hand them the merchandise in return for the cash. But also it required them to maintain a lifestyle, to identify, to create this community to be part of and uh, to expend the energy to be a member of the gated community to recruit newcomers to replace those who have been exiled to exile those who need to, who weren't sufficiently good replacements so forth also risk is huge there's the full gamut of risk everything from you join the tough mudder community and next thing you know you are running about the place in a world war one trenches reenactment complete with mustard gas and lung problems or you get really into crossfit and suddenly you realize that not only are you buff built but you can't remember what life was like when you weren't doing crossfit there's only ever been the CrossFit and cult, cult products gonna cult. So there are also things like social extra, uh, there's a bunch of things around the uh, lifestyle cost as well, around the risk of joining a particular community and being ostracized by the rest of your friends because, well, they don't match that community and that community doesn't match them and that community not taking you on board. So there's, like, there's physical risk, there's financial risk, there's every sort of risk in there. That's what makes it really interesting as an operative marketing arena is we have to mitigate that risk whilst enabling it as a feature. Outsider status drives in-group identity. If you are that small group of people against the world and you are an insider, that is a value proposition that creates an offering that has value you can identify yourself as the big hero of the narrative. You're the rebel fighting against the system. And the system may not even know you exist, but your identity becomes tied to it with the risk factor that actually that's not reality. Um, that's, that's, look, there's a bunch of those communities that drive up and down um, Northbourne Avenue periodically trying to maintain the rage that they are the freedom fighters against the oppressive world um, because someone wanted them to get free dental care or something. I Look, I know it at the technical level, but sometimes I just genuinely don't get it at the... Because I know it at the technical level, I'm staring at it going, um, hey, I can break this down for you in technical. You're getting worked. Um... Now there's two, the distribution of the product, there's two product elements here. Uh, there are the transportable tangibles, which are the markers and the identifiers, the things that say you are a part of a community. And then there are the things that are the behaviors, the digital intangible, which is your engagement within a community, your actions, your behaviors, and your digital footprint whether that's a login code to a secret squirrel website, whether it's following the right hashtag on Twitter, whether it's posting in the right group on Facebook, whatever it is, there are ways in which community membership is mediated through the digital intangible. All right, time to add a new theory into the mix. The first thing is social media is not automatically community. If you get a Tumblr, you don't have a community, you've got a Tumblr site. You've got a Tumblr account. I have a Tumblr account. I don't have a community on Tumblr. I'm kind of insta-famous on Tumblr for a number of things I've written, but I don't have... I've been reblogged by people who would not go out of their way to contact me or would not see me as a parasocial connection. So, social media accounts don't automatically create community. Community has to come from there being something of value so it's a co-creation event it's an offering that has value that's co-created it needs social connectivity it needs the social infrastructure it needs the one-to-many-to-one aspect to be able to have particularly 
one to many to one where the the many can see the goods of value being developed so conversations that uh, the fatic conversation, the idle conversation, the, hey friends, good morning friends, how, you know how you walk down a corridor between classes and you see those people who you wave to, you couldn't tell me their names, you couldn't tell me what their cat does for a living, you couldn't tell me anything about them, but saying hi and waving makes you feel like you're part of the student group. I know probably about 100 staff at the ANU that way. Uh, the shared community of the lecturer who had the lecture theatre before me and the lecturer who has the lecture theatre after me. Those 13 weeks of us being bonded together over how crap Echo 360 is and why the keyboard's not working today. Seriously, wireless keyboards. What were they thinking? And that connectivity, that shared goods of value, that kicks up and makes it uh, the starting point upon which you can start to transact. So community also begins at transactional level, information for information, knowledge for knowledge, and then builds up to emotional. So we pretty much go learn, do, feel. Now there's a couple of things uh, I want to highlight. Now this is a really old theory and neither of these theories can be tracked down anymore. The only place that the citation exists is in my textbook from pre-web 2.0. Back in the day, so actually, no, this is the 2011 text. Um, this is because uh, the dates. The plastic people rule and the internet has access to other people. If you are setting out to create a community, the people on the other side of the screen are real people. The problem is, is that they are real people. And... Some of the reasons why people go out to, to act the way they do now is that they realize they've got very easy access to real life humans who they can hurt without actually having to face a consequence of that real life human being able to hurt them right back, right away. So internet has access to other people is not as good as it used to be. And this used to be the golden rule of treat people how you want to be treated. And now it's become the uh, brass copper rule of do not let other people treat you how you wouldn't be, how you wouldn't expect to treat yourself. So the plastic people rule is that they're not NPCs. They're not randomly computer generated people on the other end of the screen. They are also real people with a caveat of they're real people. And if you're deliberately going out to hurt a real person, you got issues and you got to get that treated. You got Talk to someone about that, buddy. It's not good, it's not healthy, and it won't help you in the long term. Equally, internet has access to other people. Not every other person who you would have access to on a global network is going to be someone who you would want access to. There are people who will not want to sit next to you on the bus, and for that, you'll be grateful because you don't have anything in common that gives you that base ground of Anything other than you're both carbon-based life forms with an oxygen dependency. That's not enough to form a bond, to form a community. Not even hydrogen can bond under that. The other theory that I want to bring up here is the parasocial connection and the parasocial relationships. You've got to understand that I'm going to approach this as a marketer and a lot of the theory behind this came from psychologists and Goddamn psychologists are twisted. Psychology research is weird. And I say this as a marketer. Psychologists have a job, and their job is to pathologize the living hell out of absolutely everything and very normal behaviors because psychologists need to make more work for psychologists. Psych's gonna psych. Because this is exactly what we do as marketers. Marketers gonna market. We're gonna look at something and go, huh. Can make a value offer from that. And a psychologist is going to look at the same thing and go, we could put that in a diagnostic manual and we could make a mark from that. It's a cynical way of seeing psychology's approaches, but um, they're the ones who told us that everybody who ever took a selfie was a uh, diagnosed narcissist who needed immediate treatment. I'm like, uh huh, yep, okay. And the only people who are fine are you? There's a lot of, their literature is much darker and nastier than ours. 
Then the parasocial, and it's an important caveat, by the way, because the parasocial relationship from a marketer's perspective is potentially beneficial. There's dark sides to everything in marketing and there are unethical conducts that you can undertake and there's unhealthy behaviors in every marketing activity. But we don't start from a position of going, everything is unhealthy, therefore must be regulated. In a parasocial connection, there is a one-sided relationship. It is between the consumer and the consumed. So it's not a business to consumer relationship. It is a consumer to value offer relationship. If you feel a sense of connectivity and connectedness to a celebrity figure, and you feel a sense of social attraction, you feel some sort of connection to them at a more than technical level, then that's the potential for a parasocial relationship to form. And it can be a sense of connectedness to someone who's on TV. It can be like the entire existence of morning television and Good Morning Australia and television hosts in the mornings and breakfast hosts on radio is social cannot that social connectivity. This chirpy disembodied voice that comes over a, an alarm clock saying, good morning, rise and shine. It's FM 102 2025 and I'm name type, celebrity type with the morning news. That is a parasocial connection. We have it through radio, we have it through TV, we've got it through YouTube, now we've got it through Instagram and now we can get it self-service and dine in mode through a bunch of our social media platforms and eventually if the metaverse goes the way that uh, a lot of people want it to go we can get it a parasocial connection with something that's not even social because humans will pack a bond with anything we will have parasocial connections to virtual avatars to machine learning generated excel spreadsheets somewhere and don't tell me that there's a bunch of people out there already who don't have parasocial connections to their Excel spreadsheets. Whatever it works, however it works, what it is, is it's a one-sided relationship, it's a unilateral, and it's a consumption framework that if it's bringing you benefit and joy and positivity and good outcomes, go for it. So a couple of things is that it brings... It is also, what is the value proposition of an influencer? What is the purpose of an influencer but to influence? And if an influencer creates a parasocial connection with their audience through, and the things we know is we know that the authenticity, the sense of the being the real person in the, in the field of fakes. By the way, I'm actually just a computer generated hologram. Uh, and that disclosure is, makes me more authentic, right? I'm an old man who rants at you from a keyboard well the hell away from where you currently are. I do not want a parasocial connection with you. It's nice that you're my students. Uh, it's great that you have somewhere towards ambivalence towards me. I mark your assignments. I grade your stuff. I, that's how I go. I teach you things. I teach you content. And the parasocial connectivity is the bit where you get really awkward and weird if you go on... Is this theory talking about me and my connections to other people? Because it talks about my connections to other people. I have parasocial connections to a number of the people who I follow on the internet. Because I am vaguely invested in parts of their life. Uh, it's nice to, I absolutely love seeing their cats when they post them. I have a couple of wrestlers who I started by being a fan of their work as wrestlers. And then I ended up following them on Twitter and then found out they're actually really entertaining people. I, they're not my friends, they're just really entertaining people who, yes, I get a little bit concerned about when they're having a bad day because they're nice people who deserve nice things. And I've got a parasocial connection to them. It's real, it describes a world that exists and it's okay if you've got them. Your caveat is, like everything else, it can go wrong. If you start thinking that that connection is bilateral without the evidence of it being bilateral. If you start trying to assume that the celebrity that you've got the parasocial connection to is secretly communicating to you through their song, their music, their um, in-ring performance at WrestleMania, sound the alarms, things have gone wrong. It's gone too far. You've gone from parasocial into stalker, creepy, and get fixed.
because it's damage. Parasocial isn't damage. Going beyond parasocial into obsessiveness, compulsiveness, or any of the dark side traits is where the problem is. But the same problem arises when you think that your shoelaces are telling you stories. That means that something's gone wrong. It's not the fault of the theory. It's a, hey, that's a bug. You should possibly go see someone about getting that uh, a software update to your head to fix that. Because on the other side is that you can be entertained. The, an influencer can entertain you. you know, sometimes they'll try and sell you products. But also, some of the times, the person you're following, you're following because you like their work. And in the case of me following professional wrestlers, they will promote the shows they're on, and I'll be like, cool, I can go watch some wrestling with some people whose work I respect, like for what they do, and entertain me. Awesome, here's twenty nine ninety five. I'd like a ticket, virtual ticket to the virtual show, thanks. All right, let's look at a couple of case studies on places in which are better facilitated for community. Now, this is one of my favorite ones, actually, is Stora and the YouTube, uh, they've got their own paid community, the joiners, uh, literally. I love the fact that Stora went and, you know, the Stora army is the name for the fans who follow the overall brand and overall uh, the seven person lifestyle free running team, parkour team. The brand community is called Stora army but they call them the joiners because you got to click join. So you'll constantly hear them say, big up the joiners because that's their recognition. So it's kind of like the, yeah, thanks subscribers. Thanks subbies. Uh, I don't know what the Australian, there's got to be a more Australian way of doing it for um, Dom Tomato and his free run community. But at least he doesn't call them like things like the tomato sauce or anything like that, that I know of. Here, there's two things. One, there's the identification as part of the Stora army. And periodically now, this group maintains a parasocial to actual social connection. So they have parkour experts. They go team up with other, there's a lot of crossover and a lot of team up in parkour, uh, particularly in the UK, because Australians occasionally send away teams. So some of the people who would have started life as fans of Stora, who were parkour uh, participants who were fans who followed them might actually get the full two connection uh, from parasocial to actual social. And Stora operates out of Brighton. They wander around the streets of Brighton doing their training and you see them get stopped and interrupted by people who recognize them. Also, you see them stop and interrupt when they recognize someone else. So there is a, an actual genuine community and social community event in there. The second the big broadcasty platform that was designed to be a festering cesspit of connectivity, Reddit. God love it. It's a terrible idea that somehow worked. And it's terrible at the technical infrastructure level. Reddit is basically a wattle forum on a whole cocktail of drugs, including steroids. And somehow, now, I'm not talking anything about the content on there, the people who are on there. I'm talking about the technical infrastructure back end of the fact that anyone can create a subreddit. Any subreddit can spin off another Reddit. And there is a whole range of technical elements that says that this should just, it shouldn't work. And it does. And that's the thing that baffles me at the top level is I know the technical underpinning shouldn't function the way it does, but it does. Second thing is that because anyone can create a Reddit account, uh, you have all the different identity issues uh, from anonymous, pseudonymous, brand anonymous, and real name. And then you have moderator, you have different tiers of power and control. You have moderators, you have unmoderated moderated communities, you have communities that get uh, shut down the second the automated bots can detect them because there's a lot of illegal activity that takes place on, or attempts to take place on Reddit, and Reddit is like, do not want. There are other sites for that beyond the thing. It is at one level, it's an infrastructure. 
at another level, it's a shorthand uh, that the meta site is identified as a redditor. At the sub level, different members of different communities have different names. I don't know what the Canberra sub community identifies itself as, but functionally, it is an infrastructure that can facilitate the actions required to build a community. But equally, it can just be an information swap fest uh, where people post photos and other people post comments and no one actually feels connected to anyone else. I certainly don't see any sort of community or connection in any of the ghost hunting forums that I'm in. And equally, the Brisbane, our Brisbane and our Canberra don't feel the connection isn't there compared to what I've seen in other geo-bound communities. So it's kind of interesting on that front uh, that the infrastructure is in place, but do the shared goods of value become such that you actually feel a connection between other members of the Reddit? Or is it targeting you, you feel a connection to the Reddit? And this is important. The strongest communities are consumer to consumer and their bonds are horizontal. The weakest communities are where the bonds are vertical. Where you feel bound to the infrastructure, you don't have the same sense of belonging. Because as good as we are at pack bond bonding with code on a screen, we're better at pack bonding with other humans. Which is also the alumni challenge. The university wants you to pack bond with it as an infrastructure and as a concept. The ANU wants you to become part of the ANU alumni and it wants you to bond with it. Whereas realistically, your bonds are formed across the subjects that you've studied with the people who you've studied with. The horizontal bonds are uh, considerably stronger than the vertical bonds, but they may not be that strong overall. Uh, and particularly when the ANU then promptly shows up and says, hello alumni, money, money please. Uh, it's not really that shared goods of value that you're looking for. All right, the theory and application, let's talk about it. It is today's reading of choice is the parasocial connections. And this brings up the key idea that I've extracted out of this is self-disclosure, which is really interesting. Now I look back at this and think about what I'm doing with my YouTube show is occasionally I will tell a story of, you know, I will have a section on my show, which is a story of my life, my history. I've done some interesting things. I've done some dumb things. You get to see some of these case studies as well. As a lecturer, one of the things that we are taught to do is to embody our personal experience into our explanations of theory. That is the creation of a self-disclosure parasocial connection. If you're sitting there going, oh, for God's sake, Steve. Great, now I feel, I feel manipulated. Well, yes, you were. Um, because everything's a manipulation. Moving an object is a manipulation of the object. Moving an idea is a manipulation of the idea. Me trying to embed training and thought and then creating a learn environment for you to then feel or do afterwards is a manipulation of theoretical frameworks. It's what we do. It's awesome. It's fun. And you do exactly the same thing back to me through the creation of your assignments. You attempt to manipulate ideas to get the reward of points and scores. Now, self-disclosure. This is one of the things that gets a little interesting here is the self-disclosure creates that sense of co connectivity and connection, which builds up a little bit of the extra value of the relationship. You feel slightly more like an insider and that insider status gives you a reason. It's a buy-in to place a little more uh, value on the relationship. Authenticity and vulnerability and openness shows that there is trust. Trust begets commitment to reciprocity. The reciprocity can be unilateral. Relationship marketing tells us it doesn't have to be immediate. You can assume that down the track there will be a payoff for the loyalty that you have shown. This is why you've got weird nerds on Twitter defending Elon Musk. This is a parasocial connection with a relationship marketing parameter on the top of it of there is a sense of trust, there is a sense of commitment, and there is an expectation that somewhere in the future there will be reciprocity. And that is the extracting, that's the idea I've taken out of here is how to lift a certain level of 
lift your game on the parasocial connections and be a little bit better at creating them. And that is through authentic self-disclosure, but within a boundary and a limit. You've got to maintain yourself, the real you, the off-screen you, and the persona self that you present to the world. You want to maintain that little gap. You want a little bit of air gap between who you are and who you are on screen. Um, but you want to use as much, you want to tweak the settings around those four key ideas, authentic, vulnerable, open, and trustworthy to create that credibility that you are part of that consumer's life. And they can sh that consumer's part, their one way unilateral connection to you is something that they should value. All right. Having just said all that, there's the contact details. You don't need me. <laughs> you don't have to send me an email. You don't have to connect. You're a bunch of students who are awesome people doing their thing, but you don't need to make a parasocial connection to me. Uh, you need to write assignments and fill out stuff, show up at classes and get the job done. That's what you need. You don't need anything more than that. And with that cheery thing of Jesus community stuff, that parasocial theory talking about it is such a messy mind uh, event that takes some time to debrief, go think about uh, how things are going for you. But also feel free to look at that theory and go, yeah, that, that describes chunks of my life. I'm happy about that because it's a real thing that describes real interactions you have in the world. And that's what marketing does. We describe the world as it is, not necessarily as the world as we want to pathologize it. Right, psychology? Anyway, see you at the forums. Mm.